a very um, manly, hey. <laughs> hey, if we haven't met, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And, uh, and if you've been new, I uh, haven't been around for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike. So nice to meet you. Glad we're here together. Let me ask you a question before we get going. Anybody have a hard time getting here today? I'm not talking traffic. I'm talking motivation. I'm saying it is beautiful. We are blessed to live in God's country here in San Diego. And just looking outside, you're like, ah. Oh. I don't know if I want to do anything indoors today. I don't think I want to do anything uh, responsible today. I just want to be out enjoying what God created, just being anywhere. But we're here, we're together, so let's do this together. I love being outdoors. I know you look at me and you think, man, that guy must be a, a, an avid hiker. You know, I think I get that a lot. <laughs> But I just like being outdoors and, uh, and playing uh, uh, with, my, with my kids, riding bikes, walking, just do, doing whatever. I actually really enjoy this. I think I, think I got it from, uh, from my parents. Um, and not so much that they were outdoorsy, but they were always sending us kids outdoors. You know what I mean? It's like, get out of the house. Um, we, uh, we lived, uh, the Hodsons grew up uh, about two, three blocks from an elementary school. And so there's a big field and a playground. And so my parents were always like, hey, just go out and play. Just go. And it was one of those places that we spent a lot of time at. And it was pretty cool because it was also the elementary school that we went to. And, uh, and, and being that close to school had its benefits. You know, my parents trusted us to walk to school. There was uh, uh, four of us Hodson kids, and I'm one of the smaller Hodson kids. So we didn't have to worry about anybody messing with us, even in grade school. Uh, and then there was always kind of a, a group of other kids from the neighborhood. So we would always walk there. Uh, we'd walk home from there. And there was something kind of cool um, about getting to school. And when your friends are getting dropped off, you're like, Phew. My parents trust me to walk, whatever. I think my parents are like, no, just, just go. I, I don't care where you go, just go. Um, but if we were really good all week long, we had this, uh, this special treat on Fridays. My parents would let us ride our bicycles to school. And let me tell you, there's something impressive about being a kindergartner that rolls up on your own two-wheeler. No training wheels, like, what's up, first graders? How you doing? So it was just something really, really fun about being that close to school. And the only thing that was kind of rough about being that close to school uh, was sometimes when I had to walk home, uh, my, my journey home would get a little uh, messed up. The only thing that can ruin a great uh, kindergarten experience would be junior hires. <laughs> junior hires are not bad. They're not bad. They're just a little different. I love junior hires. I have a junior high. I just hung out with some of our junior hires. Um, but junior hires are, are different. And if you're thinking, how could you say that? That means, one, you're not a parent of a junior hire. Or two, it's been so long you forgot what junior high was like for yourself. See, junior high is awesome because uh, the, the development of their mind and the adolescence and hormones and everything's kind of spinning through them, uh, they can have moments of just uh, really like, wow, you're becoming an adult and you could think and you could process, you can interact. And then at a moment's notice, if you don't watch them, you take your eyes off them, you'll find them like in the kitchen in their underwear, like singing like beep, 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 beep and just dancing. And you're like, what are you doing? And they're like, I, I don't know. And I really believe they have no idea. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. And that's just one example I could share publicly from, from my junior hire, you know? There are plenty of me like, what are you doing? But junior hires are awesome. But because they have those moments of uh, really like young adulthood and then like, whoa, well, that's not even humanity, um, sometimes they kind of do things they just don't think through. So for me, my friends, uh, we would get out of school and uh, when we would walk home from school, being in kindergarten, you got out before junior high did. So as we're walking home, uh, sometimes there was a PE class for the junior high that was out doing their thing. And so as we're walking, we learned all sorts of amazing things from junior hires. They would yell four-letter words at us that I, I didn't understand at the time. So I went home and I'd ask my mom, hey, mom, what does this word mean? And so uh, watching your mom turn from like white to like bright red and back and forth, she's like, ah, ask your dad. So my dad explained. So, oh, uh, not only that, on occasion, if it was a real special day, um, some of those junior hires were able to find rocks as they were doing their PE. So, and you know, the thing about junior hires, let's be honest, they love to share. 
So they found rocks. They just want to give them to us. And so uh, there were times that we would uh, run under just fear of death. And I know they were probably just little pebbles, and I don't even think they came close to us. But just in a kindergartner mind, when you see something coming, it's not this big. It's this big. And you're like, we're going to die. And so we would just sprint as fast as our little legs can take us to get home. So we get home sometimes, say, Mom, this is what happened. And she'd called the school a few times. She even went down there and talked to some of the uh, administration. But you couldn't pinpoint exactly who it was. And so she said, okay, hey, here's a plan B. You know, if you, you don't feel like walking that way, uh, we found another route home. We kind of walked one block away and then a block up. And then it took us on a street uh, away from the school. And then we came home. Problem was that kind of doubled our distance. And so that doubled our time. And if you double your time on travel, that means you're missing after-school cartoons. <laughs> I'm in kindergarten. i got to get home and see my Scooby-Doo. You have priorities. And so there were times my friends and I would sit and look at each other and say, okay, are we going to take the long way and maybe miss something, or at least it wouldn't be the way we think we should, or are we going to take the, the quick way and maybe we'll have to run for our lives? And so every day we'd kind of make this decision. Looking back on it now, it's kind of a funny story and kind of like ridiculous, uh, but I think some of us are kind of still in that mindset of, of in life, we've got to make these decisions. Hey, do I take this long way around or do I take the direct route? Some people love the long way around. Some folks love getting out and checking out scenery or, or maybe you know the, the directions better than, than, than everyone else. So you can avoid traffic if you take the long way and actually get home quicker. Uh, some people don't even know they're taking the long way. They're just lost kind of out there doing their thing. Some of us, we get stuck going the long way because we're not driving. Somebody else is in control of the, 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 the car, and we're just like, man, we're stuck. And I know I'm going to hear about this, but my father-in-law, he loves the long way. Not because we're going anywhere different. He just likes to kind of cruise. Even in a parking lot, we know where we're parking, and he just kind of circles around. And it's like, all right, okay, here. We're like, just get out. <laughs> Same goes for our faith. Sometimes we get in a place where, you know, we think we know where we want to go, or we know where we want to end up, and yet sometimes we see ourselves like, I'm further out here than I ever thought. I know where I wanted to end up, I know where I wanted to go, but still, how did I get here? Today we're going to look at a story about how God intentionally took his people the long way. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. We are in Exodus, starting in chapter 13. And we're going for verse 17. As you're flipping pages, the second book in, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, some of you, if you've been around a while, you already have it marked out because we've been marching through Exodus. If you have it on your phone or your tablet or whatever, just turn that thing on, find it. If you didn't bring your Bible, lean in with a friend. Maybe you'll make a special connection today. <laughs> Bible, huh? Me too. So what's happening is, is God's people are about to leave Egypt. They've been freed. Uh, Pharaoh finally said, just get out of here. Uh, there's been uh, the plagues. There's been uh, uh, Passover. There's been all these different things going on. And finally, Pharaoh says, go. And so they're about to leave from slavery and head to the promised land. There's got to be excitement. There's got to be all sorts of good things happening. They've packed up. They've prepared. They're like, hey, we're getting ready to go. And so God says, let's start this journey. Verse 17. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. I, I love that. I, I love this picture that, that, that this God has has protected them, that our God is protecting us. Uh, see, you, you, you get the freedom. Everybody's ready to go. They're ready to head out thinking, we've been waiting for this moment for so long. And they say, hey, we're going to go to the promised land. So they know where they want to go. I don't know if they know how to get there. I don't know if they knew there was a direct path through Philistine country, but they're just, they're about to go. And God looks at them and says, look, you used to be slaves. You used to be beaten. You're not military ready. You're not ready to fight. And even though you have your, your sword and shield on, even though you're set up like a military, because that's, that's what you've seen, you're not ready for it. So instead of taking them right through Philistine country, where right there they would have got beaten up and enslaved again and conquered, even though they thought they were ready, God says, no, we're going to go the long way around. I think at times we think the same thing. Hey, I want to take the direct route. I want to get from A to B. And God says, no, we're going to take you the long way. 
Because though you think you're ready, though you think you have all your armor on and you're ready to go to battle, God says, whew, if you end up there, I don't think you're coming back. So let's continue. Verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. Kind of an interesting verse. Everybody's packed, ready to go. The U-Haul's loaded up. The minivan's all strapped down. Everyone's getting ready to go. And they're like, oh, Moses, go get the bones of Joseph. It's kind of an odd moving request, huh? I've helped a lot of people move, and no one's like, oh, yeah, my great, 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 great grandma. He's up in the attic. Can you grab him? Like, ugh, no. <laughs> but even Joseph, who'd been dead for almost 400 years at the time, knew that this wasn't it. This was not home. And so he said, just promise me, don't bury me, take me with you. So Moses says, hey, I'm going to honor that request because of who you are, so we're going to take you with you. And so they leave. After leaving Succoth, and, uh, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. I can't imagine what that looks like. We, we don't have hard numbers, but in, in chapter 12, we learn that 600,000 men are about to leave Egypt. That's not counting the women and children. That's not counting the non-Israelite people who kind of joined, and maybe some Egyptians, maybe some other travelers. But the best estimation is about 2 million people are getting ready to march here, okay? 2 million people. How big do you think that pillar of fire has to be that 2 million people can see it? How big do you think that pillar of, of, of cloud is that no matter where you're going, you can turn like, oh, we're headed that way. This has got to be an impressive scene. Just everybody going, God's presence leading, Moses behind the pillar just saying, let's march. We are headed to the promised land. And they go. Now, one thing I don't know, one thing the Bible doesn't tell us is, do the Israelites know exactly where they're going or are they just following? Do they know that there's actually a direct route that they could take? Or are they just following because, well, that's where the pillar goes, so we'll take the long way? I'm not sure. But I know at times in my life, there are moments where I don't know if I'm going the long way or the short way. I just know that, okay, I got to follow where God's taking me. And, and I think for some of us, we have found ourselves kind of out in this, this long way around, kind of taking a detour. And some of that's because of the choices we made. We thought we we're going to take a shortcut and we could do things our way. And we're just like, oh, I ended up here. How did I get here? And other times it's because we've simply been faithful and followed God step by step by step. And he's taking us a direction we didn't quite plan on. However we end up out there in the long way, if we're with God, it's exactly where God wants us to be. And so since all of us have probably had, you know, instead of A to B, we went A to B to C to D to, before we ended up in the final destination. And some of us might be in the middle of that journey. Some might be towards the end of that journey. I think there's some things to learn from this little, little story of them leaving home and headed towards the promised land. So let's look at a couple, couple life lessons from the long way around. The first thing that I think that we can learn from this is, man, God's path is always easy to find. God's path is so easy to see. Now, for them, it's very easy. They have the greatest GPS system ever, hands down. Hey, where are we going? Oh, the big flaming fire is over that way. Let's go. Wouldn't that be so easy? If every day you woke up and you just had something leading you, the, the, the pillar of smoke, the pillar of fire, no matter where you need to go, oh, I don't know, should I go here, should I go, oh, it's leaning that way, that's where I'm going to go. That would be impressive too. If you show up for like a job interview and you just have the flame, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Oh my gosh, come on in. You'd be horrible at hide and go seek though. We'd always know where you were. Like, oh, flame, there, there's Mike. But we look at that and I think at times, think, man, God, if you would give me a sign, if you would give me a miracle, I, I would follow you. I would be right there. If you just had that fire leading me, I'd be set. The Israelites had it so easy. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say I think we're better off now than they ever were. And I think if we could switch places, they would be so excited to have what we have. See, they had one fire and one pillar, and it was going that way. They didn't know anything else. That was their whole experience with God at this point. We're going to follow. 
which yes, there is some, some very powerful um, faith in that moment where you're just going to follow. But today we have more uh, access to God. We have more understanding of God and we have a better relationship with God than they ever had. Uh, not on your note sheets, but I have uh, five different ways that we could kind of hear from God and connect with God. And so if you want to jot these down, great. Um, these probably aren't going to blow your mind, but it's going to reaffirm, yeah, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. The first way that, that we connect with God is, is through his Bible, through his word. Uh, right now, probably a bunch of us are sitting here with a Bible in our laps. Maybe we got multiple copies at home. Uh, maybe you have the, the big leather-bound book. I love this thing. This is where I do all my studying with. Uh, when I'm preparing for messages, just write this thing up. Personal time, I'm in there getting going. And I love this thing. Some of you are thinking this is the only way to connect with God. And hey, that is great if you're connecting with God through it. We have the printing press and we have more access to God's word than ever before. But there's a whole new growing uh, part in technology that we've exploded in the last couple of years that now most of us can carry a, a Bible, not just a Bible, but thousands of translations and Bibles on our phone or our tablet. Some of you didn't even bring a book today, you brought your electronic device, and that's awesome. We can get God's word anywhere, anytime. I can't tell you how many times I've been hanging out with friends and they're like, oh, what's that one verse they were talking about? Oh, what is it? Uh, and you're kind of, is it Old Testament? Is it New Testament? Is it Paul? Is it that guy? And you're like, oh, well, give me a few words. Oh, there it is right there, and you know. I love the access that we have to God's word. See, God didn't leave us a pillar of fire. He said, no, here's my word. Here's everything you're ever going to need. Uh, towards the back of the book, I want you to find 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Look for 2 Timothy 3.16. God says, this is what my word is. And this is why I'm leaving you with words. Not a pillar, not smoke, not fire, not a miracle, not lightning in the sky. I'm going to leave you my word. Because any day of the week, this word is going to be more powerful and more effective than any of those quick miracles. 2 Timothy 3.16 reads, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says, any situation that you're going to face, it's in here. Now, yes, following God is important. Those people went marching. Okay, we're going to go that way. But how did they learn to be better followers while they walked? How did they learn how to be uh, uh, better friends and spouses? How did they learn how to raise their kids? How did they learn how to do their finances? How did they learn how to just interact on a daily level? They didn't. They just walked and followed. God says this word has everything and everything under the sun covered. You need a situation that's in there. But Mike, I have this really unique situation that doesn't touch on it. Well, that's fine because we have plenty of black and white issues in there that help us navigate a lot of gray. It's in there. God didn't leave us fire because he knew that, hey, even the Israelites, after following fire for a while, they lost track and they're like, hey, it's not that important. But God says, my word, this is what I need you to know. Guys, we have his word. Uh, but not just that. Uh, next to his word, we also have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was so important that Jesus said, look, when I leave, this is what I'm sending you. In fact, I need to go so he can come. Uh, if you're still in Timothy, flip a little bit to the left. We're looking for the book of John. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You could check it out in your table of contents. Totally cool. Right before Acts. It's one of the bigger ones. For John 16. So Jesus, God in flesh, here on earth with the disciples, one of the last times he's talking to him says, look, I'm about to go. And where I'm going, you can't come with me. I'll be back later, but right now I'm going to go. And while I'm gone, I'm going to send somebody to be with you because it's that important. 16, 7. It says, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Okay, Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit, but what's he going to do? Skip down a bit to uh, verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. 
He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus says, look, uh, I'm going to leave you, and God's spirit will be with you. This changed everything from that moment forward. See, back in the day, you had one person that was normally communicating with God. At this point, it's Moses. Uh, uh, throughout history, you had kings, uh, you had uh, uh, prophets, you had judges, you had different people. But at that time, there was always a separation between God and his people. So if you wanted to communicate with God, you would have to approach one of those people and say, hey, he, here's what I'm thinking, here's what's going on. Uh, can you lead me and guide me in this? And then one person would communicate with God and God would communicate back and they would go. But now with the Holy Spirit coming, that is all torn down and now we have direct connection with God. Not a flaming pillar, which, man, impressive, but a relationship where we understand that God is with us, working through us and around us. We have more connection with that than these guys ever did. But with the Holy Spirit, we're also blessed to have prayer. Prayer is this amazing uh, opportunity for us to do relationship and be able to talk directly to God. But not only to talk to God, but then to sit and listen I think sometimes we get so excited about prayer, we kind of shoot out a few things and never wait to hear back. It's like if we're texting friends and never read what they say back, we're just, God, here's what's going on, and we take off. Uh, It says in James, when it talks about prayer, it's on your note sheet, we're not going to turn and flip over, Uh, but James 1.5 says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives you all generosity and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God says, look, you don't know what you need. You don't know where you're going. You need some direction. Just come ask. I'm the designer of this universe. I'm the designer of you. I know exactly uh, where I want you to end up. I know the plans I have for you. Are you asking? Do you take the time and say, God, I have, <laughs> have an awesome opportunity to talk to the creator of the universe, but am I taking that time? Again, the Israelites, they had no one to talk to. God was distant. Through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, through prayer, man, it's right here with us. We have that relationship. But I've been there before. You know, I I know that there are times where I open up the Word and it's just not making sense today. I'm frustrated. Uh, Maybe I've been just seeking the Holy Spirit. Maybe I've been doing prayer and it's still not clear. Well, God gave us more than just those three. I think one of the um, most overlooked resources that God has given us are God's people. We have a community here of brothers and sisters, people who've been doing faith much longer than we have, that have gone through different things, that have walked through different things, that can communicate with us and kind of encourage us. Now, when you're going for advice, now I gotta be real clear with you. There are God's people, and then there's some of our knuckle-headed friends that'll give us horrible advice, you know what I mean? They'll tell you anything that they think you wanna hear. So when you're going to look for for someone to seek advice and wisdom, look for their track record. Where has their success been? How have they done life in hard times? How have they done things that that you've walked through or you're walking through? When my wife and I became parents, it became very clear that we had no idea what we were doing. Now, I did 15 years of youth ministry, and so I kind of experimented on your kids' kind of ideas and theories. (laughs) But I always sent them home, all right? These kids came home with me. Very clearly I realized, I don't know what I'm doing. And so I needed to get some advice. And I could have easily gone to my single friends that have no kids, and they'd give you some advice, like, seriously, seriously. But then I went and found people. My wife and I were talking, like, we we need some help. And, And we started going through a list of names friends that we respected because of the way they did relationship, Uh, families from the church here uh, that we saw how they had worked through tough times with high school students, and they've come out the other end, Uh, people that that their kids just adored their parents, and we said, that's the sort of people that we want to be, so we need to connect with those sort of people. So through asking questions, through walking, through kind of going through different processes, saying, hey, how did you do this, or how did that affect you? We sought out God's people, and I can tell you that I, I I think, you'd have to ask my kids, but I think I'm a better dad because of it. My single friends are still knuckleheads. I'll ask them advice on other things, but not on how to raise my kids, not on how to be a husband. They've got great advice for what they're working through, but not where I'm at. We've got to find people that have already communicated, already sought out God, have already gone forward and said, look, 
these are folks that we can trust because of how they trust the Lord. We got the Bible. We got the Holy Spirit. We got prayer. We have God's people. But sometimes even all four of those things, it's still not clear. And so we come to this worst case scenario and are like, well, what do we do? Well, worst case scenario, if nothing else is clear, just do what you know. Very simple, just do what you know. And someday doing what you know is just putting one foot in front of the other. God, I don't understand what you're doing here in my finances, but I'm going to trust you in them. God, I don't know what to do with my relationship. It seems every time the whole family's together, we just lose our mind. But I'm going to trust you in that. God, I come home from work and I'm so just worn out and I don't want to go to my growth group. I don't want to be with your people, but I'm going to trust you. Sometimes the, 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 the most impacting and powerful thing we could do is simply trust God and take that next step when we don't feel like it. God's path is easy to find because if we seek it, we're going to see it. We're going to be able to read about it. We're going to be able to pray about it. We're going to be able to consult our friends about it. Uh, we're going to be able to just faithfully take one step in front of the forward. But the problem is, even though we find God's path, sometimes it's not going to be the path we would choose. All of us have had situations in our lives that we would look at and say, oh man, I would never want to do that again. I think at times God keeps us kind of wanting more, so to speak. He, he didn't tell us, hey, this is where the, uh, the, the whole journey goes. This isn't where we're going to walk through. These aren't, these aren't the steps we're going to take. He simply says, hey, okay, we're going to go this way. With the Israelites, he doesn't say, hey, you're going to take one of the longest detours in all of human history. He just says, okay, now follow me and let's go. Not only do they take the long road, but if you know the end of the story, you know that they end up taking a longer road on their own. But I think God doesn't give us the end result or the, the full journey because he wants us to rely on him. Now imagine with me that your whole road, you could just see it. You knew that you were going to have to walk through uh, financial crises. You knew you were going to have to walk through job loss. You knew you were going to uh, walk through losing loved ones. You knew you were going to walk through uh, some of the most uh, painful struggles, addictions, uh, just confusing times of your life. And you look at all that from the beginning. Do you say, hey, I'm on board, let's go? I don't know. I have no idea. To be honest, I'm not sure if I would. I've been open with, uh, with our, our family situation. Um, about three years ago, my wife and I, we, we finalized the adoption for four amazing kids. We started with, uh, I, speaking out loud, I can't believe we did this. Uh, we, we started with a, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, and a 13-year-old. And let me tell you, when four kids just move into the house, you go from zero to infinity. Life doesn't get confusing or strenuous. It gets insanely confusing and strenuous. Just like, boom, everything exploded. And I can tell you now, over the past three years, they're the greatest blessings that my wife and I have ever experienced. I love every day coming home and hanging out with my kids. Even on the worst days that we have, I'm so blessed. Greatest thing that God has ever blessed us with. But if you rewind the tape, six years ago, hearing... We're infertile. Not the greatest blessing I've ever been a part of. Four years ago, when we get the surprise pregnancy, but then the loss, not the greatest blessing. Four years ago, sitting in front of doctors hearing, this, this is it, we can't do anything else for you, it's not going to work. Not the greatest blessing I've been a part of. I have big shoulders, I can take a lot, and, and I feel like I can manage myself and I'm okay in crisis but sitting across from a wife who I said, I love you, I'll protect you, I'll lead you, I'll do the best I can to be the man that you need, and watching her break down and cry and having nothing to say and just knowing I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I cannot fix this one, was not the greatest blessing I'd ever been a part of. And if I went back and God said, Mike, here's your path to becoming a dad, I don't know. I'm so blessed now, but I have no idea if I'm willing to grab my wife's hand and say, baby, let's go. It was some of the hardest, scariest, darkest moments of my life to where I did look at God and say, God, what are you doing? Now, so blessed. I know now. But if you laid it out in front of me, I don't know. I think God doesn't want us to know all of it because we need to remain faithful and trusting in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it's on your note sheet. 
If you want to find it, this is one of those that you might want to write down, memorize. Some of you probably already know it. Book of Proverbs is right after the book of Psalms. It's the biggest book in the Bible. Pretty easy to find. Old Testament, kind of third of the way through the book. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I think the reason why we don't know where the path leads or what the path will lead through is because God says, do you trust me in this? Trust is easy when it's sunshine and daisies outside. Trust is not easy when it is dark and scary and you feel so alone. But God says, do you trust me in this? And when we get to a point where we are going to trust him with all of our heart, and that means the parts of the hearts that resent, the parts of the heart that fears, the parts of the heart that is broken, but saying, God, I trust you in this. I do not like this. I do not appreciate you taking me through this. And God, someday I'm going to be so happy when this is over. But right now, I will trust you in this. Because when we lean on our own understanding, when we try to make the journey about us, when we try to take our own path, God says, look, I can't bless that. But if you stick with mine, if you follow me one step after one step after one step, I've got you covered because I know the direction we're going. But Mike, when you make it about you, when you kind of try to take the shortcut, when you try to do it your way, I cannot bless that. This may not be the journey that we chose. This may not be the path that we wanted. But God says, look, if you're following me, I can bless that. I can work with that. When we get that far out in the sticks and we're not sure where we're going, we can either choose to continue to follow God or we can try to blaze our own trail. And God says, well, you're on your own until you come back to me. Guys, this might not be the journey we picked, but it's the one that God put us on. So will we trust the path or will we try to trust ourselves? Now, one of the problems with being on a journey that you didn't choose is we don't really know how long it's going to take. And sometimes around the journey, the journey can take a whole lot longer than we plan. Third, fill in the blank. The journey may be longer than expected. I want to take a second and talk to you about ballet. I started when I was about 60. No, I'm kidding. I didn't know. <laughs> that guy? Dude, let me break this out. Ballet. I, I don't really have a thing for ballet, but I, I love someone who loves ballet, so I've learned a little ballet. And no, I have not learned it. I've learned about it. Okay, let me clarify I come home from work one day and there's my daughter. She has the TV on and she is spinning and jumping and she's watching ballet of some sort. I don't know if it was the Nutcracker, which is the only thing I know because it's on every year, um, or something else. And so as my daughter's going and she's just spinning, she doesn't know I'm watching. She just has this big smile on her face and it's one of those smiles that you're like, oh, I love you. And so as I watch, she finally sees me, runs over and gives me a hug and I said, Hey, babe, do you you want to learn ballet? She goes, yeah, yeah, I'd love that. I said, okay, great. I have a friend that that has a dance studio. Let's call him and and see if we can do some ballet. And so she's just excited. So I get her enrolled in the class. Okay, well, what do we need? And they kind of give me the list of everything because you just can't go to ballet, right? You need to dress for ballet. It's the uh, get up, whatever, the right shoes, the little uh, frilly. Somebody said tutu. Okay, all right, there you go. Dancers unite. Yes, we'll high step our way out of here. And so she gets dressed. She's ready to go. And, and so we, we take and go, and she's so excited. She's beaming. She just can't wait to get in there. And so uh, the way the studio is set up is they have kind of the dance room, and they have this uh, uh, see-through window that you can kind of sit next to uh, so the teacher can teach and the parents can just watch. And as my daughter runs in and, and the class starts, I, I remember sitting there, and I, I just watch. I see this, this little girl do jumps that I had no idea this little girl could do. Uh, she, she spun faster uh, than I thought was humanly possible. And she danced with such grace and elegance. And I remember just watching, thinking, her parents must be so proud of her. <laughs> my little girl, my little girl was on the wall telling all the other students what to do. 
And they're looking at her like, who are you? This is your first time in class. Who are you? And she goes, oh, I saw this on TV. This is what we got to do. And my little girl, she got some sass and some attitude. So all these other girls are like, okay, all right, we'll do whatever. So we get out of class. I'm like, babe, what, what, what were you doing? She goes, I was teaching. I said, no, you're supposed to go and learn. And she goes, but I know ballet. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, how about next time we go back and you just learn, you let the teacher teach. And so she went about three or four times, uh, a couple weeks, and uh, it got abundantly clear that she came out one day and just, she said what I already knew. She goes, yeah, dad, I, I know enough ballet. I'm good. <laughs> All right. Four weeks of ballet. You're set, girl. Let's go knock it out. <laughs> it's a silly story, but I think some of us kind of take that same approach to following God. See, we think that, hey, I've, I've seen some on TV or I read it in your book. I've kind of experienced a few rough patches. I'm good, God. I've learned faith. And God says, no, 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 we're just getting started. We've got so much more to go. We've got so much more to go through. And we're like, wait, 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 wait. I had my four weeks. I had my, my experience. But the thing is, the journey the journey is, is preparing us for the destination. And sometimes when God leads us and takes us, it's going to be so much longer than we expected. And other times we're going to get immediate results and we're going to think, okay, that's how it should always be. But God says, no, do you trust me? Do you trust me with the next step? Are you willing to continue, willing to continue? I want you to find in your Bibles um, 2 Peter kind of towards the back of the book. It's about the last third. Second Peter is right after First Peter. Love how that works. Right before First, Second, and Third John. Peter is, is, Peter's writing about the time frame and the struggle and the life and the things that are going on. And he says, guys, you got to understand something about our Lord. It's not as easy as we think sometimes. It's not as quick as we desire sometimes. But if it's in God's time, it's the right time. So 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Don't you love that verse and hate that verse? <laughs> it's awesome because we know that at any moment when God shows up, there are moments where you're, you're thinking about stuff like, hey, I got to pray about that. And it's so abundantly clear before you even get on your knees, like, whoa, God's working. I love God's time. But then there's that flip side of the verse where you're like, God, come on, man. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. But it's God's time. If we go back to the story in Exodus, before Moses left, the last thing he did was he grabbed dry bones. He grabbed Joseph. Joseph passed away 400 years before they left. Not only did Joseph wait his whole life, he said, whenever you leave, take me with you, because Egypt is not my home. If it's 10 years, if it's 10,000 years, just please promise me you'll take me with you, because he wants to go to the promised land. He wants to go home. Guys, sometimes our, our, our journey is going to take us longer and longer and longer, and sometimes we'll look at it and say, how come I haven't arrived yet? How come I'm not there yet? Because God says, look, this isn't it. This isn't the end. We get so caught up in the, the journey. We, we get so caught up in our timelines that God says, you're, you're missing the point. That I'm taking you somewhere. I know exactly where we're going. And even though we might not uh, like the path we're on, we might not like how long it takes, there's one thing, there's one promise that I could tell you about the long way that is just, it makes everything worth it. The long way always leads home. Always leads home. We get so frustrated because we're struggling. We get so frustrated because it doesn't make sense right now. Well, that's because we're looking at the path and not the destination. 
God never said, hey, I'm gonna come and, and die for you to have a comfortable life. I'm gonna bless you financially. I'm gonna give you a sweet house and a sweet car. Some of us have those things, great. Thank God for them. Some of us are working every day just to get by. And some of us are on the path saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get by. If we have a little, if we have a lot, if we're somewhere in between, God says, trust me and keep walking because this is not home. This is the path and I'm going to get you home. They probably hated the desert. Well, God didn't say, hey, let's camp in the desert. He says, I'm taking you to the promised land. For some of us, we get confused on what the end result looks like. I want to look at two verses with you that kind of help clarify this idea. Uh, I want you to find Romans. If you're still in Peter, it's uh, towards the left. It's after Acts. Romans 8, verse 18. A guy named Paul is writing this letter. He's going to go out to, to all of his friends. And he's giving them so much great info, info, info. But he's also being real honest. And he's talking about his struggles and where he's at and what he's gone through. And he says, hey, I understand your struggles too. There's so much in this life to be bummed about, to be frustrated about, to be, be confused about. But then we come across this verse. 8.18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He says, yeah, it's rough right now, but this isn't home. This isn't the end. He says, yeah, it's rough, and we're not going to discount that. I'm not going to ever look at you and say, well, buck up, little man. No, you're going to struggle through it. I'm going to struggle through it with you. We're going to pray. We're going to seek God. And there's going to be moments where like, oh. But God says, look, I have a destination for you. This isn't the end result. I want you to find um, 2 Corinthians. If you're in Romans, just start flipping to the right. You get Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, again, this is another letter written by Paul that he has such this, this great understanding of, of where we're at and yet also where we're going. And this is one of those verses that I've had the honor and the privilege to read over friends who have passed away and already made it home. And sometimes you read this on, on hushed tones because it's sad, because normally it means you're saying goodbye to someone. But for me, it's a, it's a verse of victory and it's a verse of direction. It's one of those we should read with excitement. It says, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and then each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Paul says, look, we know we're going to struggle here. We know we're going to desire more. We know we're going to want something else because this isn't home. And the longer we're here, the longer we're away from home. And the destination, you, you kind of try to fill that longing with all sorts of different things. And we think, if I just get this, I'm going to be content. And we, we don't. Ooh, if I can just get that relationship or that much money or that new hobby or that new sport, I can get it. And you're not content because our longing is for home. And somewhere we got tricked to think the path, the journey, is so much more important than the destination. And God says, do you trust me? If you trust me, let's keep walking. Because I know where the destination is. And I know where this path leads. Guys, I could promise you one thing. That when they reached the promised land, they never looked back and said, man, I really want to go on that journey again. Nobody who made it to the end ever looked back and said, man, can we go back to Egypt and start over? The path is long. The path might be hard. You will walk through things that are just infuriating and frustrating and heartbreaking. But God says, if you follow me, I will lead you home. 
We have a God that loved us so much he died to have relationship with us. But that wasn't enough. He rose again from the grave and said, now follow me, we're going home. We're on a journey, but it's leading home. And I can't think of a greater place that we'd want to be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves us, who gives us direction, who leads us. Lord, we thank you for your word that can give us direct understanding of who you are and how we respond. We thank you for communication with you. We thank you for your people. We thank you for your spirit, God. And Lord, wherever we're at on this journey, if we're just beginning it, if we're in the middle of it, or if we kind of close to the end of it, God, may we be people who look to you and may you lead us home. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, let me, let me kind of finish up. I know I started my kindergarten story, didn't finish it. I would get home every day, and there was mom, normally some sort of snack and Scooby-Doo, you know, you got it. But once I got home, and I was in a place where I was loved and cared for, never thought about how I got there. I just knew I was home. Someday we're going to make it home, and we're really going to look back and say, ah, oh, the journey, it's not worth it. This is where we belong. As you go, turn and say hi to someone on the journey, and uh, we will see you next week. Love you guys. See you later.